So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you very much um, for Professor Niels Weidmann's kind introduction, especially for his generous uh, invitation to this conference and his meticulous organization. Then I think I will have three days uh, to learn from all of you. Now, um, the following lines, the following pages are thoughts that um, I have laid down since some time, but I think this is the first time I I have, you know, um, um, reflected on the problem of spaces, but I immediately, I, I just, <laughs> um, I agree with um, Professor uh, Weizmann's remarks uh, a moment ago that the space is never homogeneous and then um, there are very different dimensions of space. So I have, um, at the beginning, um, I began with some thoughts on different, some um, dimensions of spaces. That's why I, I I will illustrate them with respect to the geographic, linguistic, and pictorial, and ethnographic aspect. But I think these reflections are just um, not yet mature. So I'm, I welcome your critical remarks and questions. <clears throat> so um, I, please follow me to read out, uh, we'll read out just my PowerPoint. Interculturality is a question of border crossing. The history of philosophy, European or Chinese, can no more be read from the perspective of linear time, as both have become intercultural during their historical unfolding. Starting from the insights of Elmer Hollenstein's um, innovative geography of philosophy, we will consider an intercultural text of the seventh um, century, the Chinese translation of the Buddhist Heart Sutra by the Tang Chinese monk, Shen Jiang. This short text is just about 260 verses in Chinese. It's still one of the widest read classic of Mahayana Buddhism in cultural China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam today. By explaining the linguistic and pictorial space embedded in the classical Chinese writing of the Ha Sutra, we'll try to show that philosophical thinking has already been practiced outside the Indo-European languages in the early Middle Ages in East Asia. But the deployment of a pictorial space is not necessarily the result of a certain written logos. The facial art of Amazonian Indians, as recorded by Levi Strauss, is a marvelous example of pictorial space in a human community without writing. But how to construct cultural universals out of cultural pluralities? Philosophy still has to learn from other human sciences, in particular from anthropology, in a manner of Meloponti's complexity with Levi Strauss. So section one, Elmer Hollenstein's geography of philosophy and intercultural dynamics. In his inno innovative philosophy atlas, Ocht und Weger des Denkens, published in 2004, the Swiss philosopher Elmer Hollenstein has inaugurated a new way of reading the history of philosophy from the approach of regional space. By locating the place of birth of philosophers, the place of philosophical teaching or related philosophical activities, the place of propagation of philosophical works and the language used, this geographical approach aims at understanding the birth of philosophical ideas and doctrines, as well as the diffusion in influences. This mode of reading the history of philosophy does not merely pay attention to the contents and concepts of philosophical doctrines in themselves but also consider the way in which philosophical thoughts were transmitted across geographical areas and exercise their influences outside their birthplaces and their original languages through times. Such a view of history of, philo of philosophy has its eye not limited to the reception of thoughts of a certain philosopher or philosophical school within its own communal or cultural boundary, but also on the way such thoughts were spread across national, geographical, racial, and linguistic borders to become translinguistic and transcultural phenomena. By proposing such a geography of philosophy, Hollenstein's ambition is to rewrite the history of philosophy of humankind, or at least to provide the basic framework of such a history from the translinguistic and transcultural perspective. Such a history of philosophy from a global perspective 
emphasizes not only the plurality of purposes of philosophy, but also the plurality of language use in philosophical activities. By depicting in a concrete manner the pluralist traditions of philosophy, Hollenstein's geography of philosophy results in showing the narrowness and ignorance not only of Eurocentrism, but also of any form of cultural centrism, increasing some time of Sinocentrism. The most expressive form of Eurocentrism in philosophy is presented by Hegel in his lectures on the history of world philosophy. There, the official philosopher of the Prussian state presents the historical development of philosophy according to the direction of rotation of the earth from the east to the west. According to Hegel, philosophy has its historical starting point in China, which is geographically situated on the eastern part of the group, thus excluding Japan from the world philosophical family from the very outset. The form of philosophy represented by China is the most primitive, thus the most elementary one. It moved westward to China as the intermediate, sorry, it moved westward to India as the intermediate stage and was elevated on the German soul of the early 19th century Europe to the most advanced form of philosophical consciousness. Now, this is um, the Atlas proposal made by uh, Hollenstein of the movement of philosophy from the East to the West, from the lowest degree to the highest stage. To Hegel, philosophy is the highest form of manifestation of the cultural spirit of humankind. In its most abstract form, the history of philosophy is the progress from the stage of intuition and shall to the stage of concept, Begriff, via the intermediate stage of representation, Vorstellung. In terms of concrete cultural manifestation, the progress of the spirit follows the developmental path from religion to art and then to philosophy as self-reflective thinking of the highest form. In many cultures, there exists only religion and art, but no philosophy. Thus, to Hegel, this is a sign of their cultural inferiority. However, language is a necessary and prerequisite condition for the exercise of religious, artistic, and philosophical activities. What is then the precise role played by language in these spiritual domains of humankind? Does language not occupy a more fundamental role than religion, art, and philosophy in human culture? How does linguistic space provide the space for the play of concepts essential to philosophy or philosophizing? To these important questions, Hegel has not devoted any serious consideration. He even considered art as dumb artwork, stummen Kunstwerk. It seems that Hegel does not recognize the role played by language in the conception of artworks, nor the permanent role of language in poetry, literature, and myth. To Hollenstein, if we want to write the history of philosophy from a global perspective, we must exit from the narrow views of the history of philosophy of Kant and Hegel. These two giants of German idealism have for sure exercised immense influences on the later development of Western philosophy and even global philosophy. But they knew practically nothing about important figures and their works in philosophical traditions outside Europe. Kant and Hegel did not know philosophers from India or South Asia, such as Narajuna, Vasubandhu, Patitrihari, Dhammakitriti, and Shankara. No philosopher from China like Sunzi, Wang Bi, uh, Fan Zhang, Zhu Xi, and Wang Yangbing, and neither the Japanese Ugyo Suai. Suai. Hollenstein also reminds us that it was also impossible for Kant and Hegel to know the archaeological discoveries around the world since the mid 19th centuries. For example, they had no knowledge of the teachings of the Tahoptet. The ancient Egyptian text excavated from Cambridge in 1847, whose state of composition is estimated to about 2,388 before Christ. And it's, it is the eternal earliest known poetry and literary work of human history. Now, Khan and Hegel would have known the hymn to the sun attributed to the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaton, that is uh, around 14th century be before Christ. According to Hollenstein, these hymn poems present a non-deist and non-mythological conception of nature 
close to the cosmological mode of thinking appeared later in Europe. These excavated texts were composed earlier than the Bible written in Hebrew by 1,000 to 2,000 years. We should rather follow the Roman philosopher Cicero. Instead of taking to the narrow sense of philosophy prescribed by Hegel, Cicero pointed out in the Tusculane Disputazione that the existence of philosophy is an event much earlier than the birth of the term philosophia, which is recent. Thus, the history of philosophy has its origin earlier than the Greek city of Athens, as recorded by European documents. If we consider the condition leading to the exercise of philosophical activities, human communication on the basis of dialogue, which demonstrates the spiritual capacity to reflect on herself and on the world and the world around her, and not the appearance of the term philosophia, Hollenstein thinks that the birth of philosophy is in none of the three places named by Karl Jasper in his famous theory of the Axial Age. That is, philosophy is born neither in the northern coast of the Greek Inner Sea, nor in India or Naples of Southern Sea, nor in the central part of China, but in the place of historical origin of Homo sapiens, Africa. Now, this is a complicated map constructed by Hollenstein about the movement, the birth and the movement of philosophical ideas. That is a rather provocative suggestion, but Hollenstein has his reasons. This is a very important stage in the development of linguistic capacity and the mode of communal life by humankind. Al-Farabi, one of the most important early Islamic philosophers, has said, philosophy is older than religion. It means that the wisdom embedded in the most ancient documents of humankind is earlier than the ethical norms and their justification included in the religious treatise appeared later. Philosophy in the form of scholarly doctrines appeared the latest. To Hollenstein, Jasper's conception of history of philosophy expressed in his theory of the Excel Age represents a candelabra model to conceive the beginning of, a philo of philosophy in human history. Now, this is a Pandora model constructed by Hollenstein. Instead of Hegel's linear mode of development, Jasper recognizes that human civilization has witnessed an intellectual breakthrough during the years 800 BC to 200 BC across the group. Almost at the same period, there appeared independently philosophical sent cultures in the West, in India, and in China, with foundational philosophers represented by Plato, Siddhartha Gautama, and Confucius. Their, their thoughts share a common characteristic that is proposing a, demytholo a demythologizing way to understand the nature, the nature, the natural order. However, According to Hollenstein, Jasper's candelabra model does not in inquire into the conditions of possibility and the historical process through which these three philosophical civilizations arrive at the exceptionally advanced cultural achievements. Had they not all gone through a historical process of their own before arriving at such civilizational heights? It is certain that the representative thinkers of these three civilizations did not know one another's works and did not speak the language of the two others. But Hollenstein asks, was each of these three great civilizations entirely isolated from all other civilizations? Did they not have exchange and communication with other civilizations? As in Hegel's conception, in Yasvet, all of these three exo age civilizations are self-sufficient. They do not need any exchange nor any communication with other civilizations in order to develop into a superior stage. In addition, Jasper shared with Hegel's view that only Western or European culture has development throughout history. Other cultures, even that of India and China, are stagnant. Is it view of culture not a bias? Can it defend itself face to actual historical observation? Hollenstein's criticism of the Hegelian and Jasperian world of cultural stagnation with regard to Indian and China can be further clarified 
from the philosophy of culture of the contemporary Chinese philosopher, Lao Ziguang, was my teacher. Lao's philosophy of culture can be summarized as proposing a historical dynamic will, Li Xi Dong Tai Guan. Every culture has two essential phases of development throughout history. A first phase of birth and growth, leading to the formation of essential cultural characteristics. And a subsequent phase of cultural change as a result of interaction with other cultures faced with facts or challenges from the latter. Birth and growth is essentially a process of, of internal development. Cultural change is often the result of exchange and interaction with other cultures. Confucianism and Taoism are the two essential components of Chinese culture of the pre qi period, that means two centuries before Christ. But the introduction of Buddhism from India in China since the first century AD has considerably transformed Chinese culture, not only in the philosophical and religious aspects, but also in the daily life of Chinese, from the imperial court to common people. In our sequence terms, Hegel's and Yappa's view is that only European culture enjoys a dynamic process of development. All other cultures are historically stagnant. Horenstein emphasizes intercultural dynamics since the early development of human cultures. His geography of philosophy starts from inquiring into the relation between geography and culture, in particular, the relation between geography and philosophy. Human being is a being of freedom, and the birth of philosophy is the manifestation of human freedom. However, human being is never free from the conditions of her environment. Yet Hollenstein does not follow the determinism of physical geography of the 19th century. He pays more attention to factors around human settlement, in particular the appearances of city and their structures, whether their system of routes and network of transportation are favorable for commerce, exchange of commodities, and cultural development. These considerations will help to understand the relation between geography and cultural activities, in particular the birth and development of philosophical, philosophical activities this is a way to understand the development of culture and ideas of different cultural regions away from the purely ideational soil. Cultural diffusion across geographical and linguistic borders is a sign of intercultural dynamics. Here, Hollenstein also pays attention to the importance of passivity. He was among the earliest phenomenologists to research into Husserl's phenomenology of passive synthesis and passive genesis. In the learning of a foreign language, our capacity of passive understanding, that is, listening and reading, and reading, is stronger than our capacity of active creation, that is, speaking and writing. We learn first of all to listen before we can learn to speak, and we learn first of all to read before we can learn to write. Yet in artistic creation, the relation to passivity is somewhat different. The viewer or appreciator of an artwork may perceive a more profound or hidden sense of this same artwork unseen by its creator. In some cases, an artwork may not be accepted in its original place of production, but may receive more appreciation when it is transmitted to another culture or another regional space, thus accelerating the speed of its diffusion in a wider geographical or cultural context. So I will illustrate it in the second uh, section. Buddhism as an illustration of intercultural dynamics and Xuan Jiang's Chinese translation of the Ha Sutra as an intercultural text. The diffusion of Buddhism in China as a prominent example of intercultural dynamics. Buddhism as religion and philosophy was founded first in India in the 6th to 5th century BC. First introduced in China in the 1st century AD, Buddhism became the major Chinese religion side by side Taoism since the Tang Dynasty, that means the 7th to the 10th century. A great many Buddhist scriptures were translated into Chinese all along. The philosophical doctrine of these Buddhist scriptures, foremost the Mahayana Buddhist school, constitute the core of Chinese Buddhist philosophy besides Confucian and Taoist philosophies. Yet in its original place of birth, the Indian subcontinent, Buddhism was in sharp decline since the 12th century due to the spread of Islam. 
The rise and diffusion of Buddhism in South and East Asia is a concrete phenomenon of intercultural dynamics between the two Eastern philosophical civilizations in Japan's in Japan's theory of the Exile Age. On this part of the world, philosophy is an intercultural affair very early on. The case of the Mahayana Buddhist text, that means the Heart Sutra, can be used to illustrate the intercultural dynamics of Buddhism as religion and philosophy. Heart Sutra is the modern English translation of the title of this sutra, whose original title in Sanskrit is Hananparamitra Rataya, and in, in, in Chinese it's Boy. But something. It is in uh, a dialect in Cantonese, but it's closer to the speaking language of the Tang Dynasty. Today, it's in Beijing, in um, 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 it's very different. It is But it has only four tones. Whereas in Cantonese Chinese, that means the closest to the Tang speaking language, it's nine tones. A big difference. Since this sutra is popularized, with the simplified title of Xinjing in China, and most of its early translation into other East Asian languages, that means Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Thai, as well as into other European languages, that means German, French, and English in the 19th century, are based on a Chinese version of, translated by the Tang Chinese monk Xuanzang, 602 to 664. This text is commonly known through the title of Ha Sutra. Philosophical philological specialists of the Hat Sutra dispute about the origin of this text. One theory maintains that the sutra is originally written in Sanskrit and later translated into Chinese by Xuan Zhang. Another theory believes that it was in fact Xuan Zhang who has composed and arranged the text in Chinese with excerpts from the Mahaprana Pagambita Sutra, which Xuan Zhang himself has produced a Chinese translation in the form of a concise summary just 2,060 words, of the doctrine of supreme intelligence based on the metaphysics of emptiness, sunyata, of all phenomena expressed in this Mahayana Buddhist classic. The core of the metaphysics of emptiness of Mayanaha Buddhism is expressed in these well-known and popular verses. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Sik tik si hong, hong tik si sik. The five aggregates of human existence, namely form, feeling, Volitions, perceptions, and consciousness are equally empty. All phenomena are empty. The understanding of the metaphysics of emptiness leads to the supreme intelligence with regard to ultimate reality. Nothing in the phenomenal world is substantial nor stands forever. With this intelligence arises the wisdom of non-attachment to any form of ignorance, desire, unattainable dreams, aging, and death. Thus, there is no aspiration toward any acquisition nor any means to acquire whatsoever. The practical implication of this stage of self-awareness self -awareness, is a stage of no suffering and no obstruction to a clear mind and no fear. And being awoken provides the gateway to liberation, to nirvana, the shore of the world beyond. What is remarkable about Xuan Zhang's Chinese version of the Heart Sutra is that it transmits a profound metaphysical doctrine and its practical implication in terms of self-cultivation in an incomparable clarity of expression and economy of words. That is why it remains popular 13th century after, after its creation, at least in East Asia. The following clip is a proof. Contemporary Japanese Buddhist monks create Japanese mu Buddhist music based on Xuan Zhang Chinese version of the Heart Sutra. The recitation is conducted in a pronunciation basically monosyllabic and close to Cantonese Chinese, which is the descendant of the phonetic system of the Chinese language of the Tang Dynasty, that means from the 7th to 10th uh, uh, centuries. That's it now, please. Ha 
So section three, the linguistic space of Chinese language and its relation to thinking, the debate between Humboldt and Abel Hindusa. However, to European linguistic and philosophical communities, the term Chinese is a synonym of incomprehensibility. How is it possible that a language which has the reputation of being incomprehensible, Chinese, can serve the role of intercultural communication between the two actual age civilizations of philosophy represented by India and China? To those who hold that philosophy derives its possibility from the Greek logos and thus insist that philosophy speaks Greek only, it is simply impossible to accept the idea that the Chinese language, whose structure is extremely far away from the Greek language and its descendants, has the competence to express philosophical ideas of universal intent. Within classical phenomenology, Heidegger is the one who has insisted all along his philosophical life that philosophy speaks Greek and only Greek. He has a philosophical reason. The central question of philosophy from its Greek beginning is the question of the meaning of being. This is a question which animates Greek thinkers' reflection, but is never explicitly pursued since it was always covered up. Can the meaning of being be translated into other languages, in particular into non-European languages? If so, this question has a universal intent and it can be expressed in other languages. Does this not mean that philosophy speaks in more than one language and has shown itself to be a cross-cultural intellectual enterprise? If Heidegger and his adepts insist that the question of the meaning of being cannot be translated into any language outside the Greek linguistic family, then it is marked by cultural relativity. It cannot impose itself as a central question of philosophy outside the European linguistic border. For those who are familiar with the works of Derrida, it is well known that he has raised the question of the Eurocentric nature of logocentrism in philosophy in the uh, published as early as now 1967, by reference to the Chinese and Japanese languages, which are largely non-phonetic. But Derrida has not further pursued the question how these basically non-phonetic and idiogrammatic languages can exercise philosophical thought. 
It seems that Derrida was unaware that almost a century and a half earlier, such question had been the subject of scientific debate between two specialists of language across the two sides of the river Rhine. So there's a, there was an Ayanda section between Humboldt and Abel Hemusa. The German philosopher of language Wilhelm, Wilhelm von Humboldt and the French sinologist Albert Hemusa has engaged themselves in a public Ayanda section on the particularity of the Chinese language and its possibility to express rigorous thoughts. This debate is a significant intercultural event in itself in the double sense of the term, a Franco-German debate and then the language of the third culture, namely Chinese. All began by the ambitious study of Wilhelm von Humboldt entitled On the Origin of the Grammatical Forms and the Influence on the Development of Ideas. This is developed to the Academy of Sciences of Berlin in 1822 and published in the same year as a monograph. The French sinologist Jean-Pierre Abel Hemusard, who is the first chair of sinology at the College de France, published a critical review article in 1824 in Journal Asiatique, Journal Asiatique, Grand de sur la naissance des formes grammaticales de Humboldt. Humboldt replied to the review of Abel Hemusard by an open letter written in French. Let a Monsieur Abel Hemusard sur la nature des formes grammaticales en général et sur le génie de, langue, de la langue chinoise en particulier. Published in 1827. That means letter to Abel Hemusa on the nature of grammatical forms in general and uh, on the genus of Chinese language in particular. Hobbes started from a regulative philosophical principle with regard to language. It is by means of well-constructed grammatical forms that the language succeeds in fulfilling its function of providing connection within a structural whole between words or parts of speech which are representations of different aspects of a speaking subject's sensible perceptions in the world. Thought is nothing other than forms of connection or relation between different parts of a speech to form a coherent discourse. Grammatically well-formed languages are languages composed of words with inflection, which enable language to express with certainty the grammatical functions of indications of tense, mood, person, gender, and number, etc. To Humboldt, only grammatically well-formed languages exhibit a perfect capacity to develop, to develop ideas and thoughts. And it is grammatical forms which provide the general schema of connection of a discourse. Languages without grammatical forms are inferior languages, as they have a poor capacity to express ideas and thoughts. To Humboldt, as there is no inflection in verse in Chinese, this language is too in indeterminate and not a grammatically well-formed language. Compared to classical languages such as Greek, but also German, the Chinese language is an inferior language. In his review article, Albert Hemusa raised a serious objection to Humboldt. On, his on Humboldt's dismissal of Chinese as a grammatically well-formed language, he reminded Humboldt that Chinese is, I quote, one of the most abundant languages of Asia, whose literature is the richest and the most scholarly in my translation. How come such a language which has existed since 4,000 years could be considered as an inferior language? This is a question raised by Abel Himusa. Abel Himusa agreed that the grammatical form of Chinese is different from the Latin languages. These languages have the genitive and thus representative, thus represent without ambiguity the relation between the whole and the parts between the subject and the attribute, as well as between the cause and the effect, etc. But it is, I quote, rather an advantage than an inconvenience to be able to get rid of form in word formation in the way of German or English. For the rigidity of grammatical form of this letter allows modification in which, I quote, are in greater varieties, more precise and more rigorous, but by the same token, less free, less quick, and less energetic. My own translation. Abraham Musa called upon Humboldt to conduct further reflection face to challenge of the Chinese language. He writes, in a language with lax grammatical forms, where almost all words without exception can alternately play the role assigned to nouns, adjectives, verbs, adjectives, and even to particles, can find clear rules, constant and positive, in order to always arrive at net and precise expression of thoughts and with, with all the modification which is susceptible to be. Voila, 
in its generality, the phenomenon presented by Chinese grammar. And one should add that the language under consideration has served to do presentation in a way as lucid as the Greek, the platonic doctrines and the subtitles and the subtleties of the metaphysics of Brahmans. My own translation too. In a word, the extreme fluidity of the Chinese language is not a hindrance to the expression of ideas with precision. It rather allows the freedom of expression not tolerated by strict grammatical forms. Hombok took into serious considerations of Abraham Musa's criticism and revised his general theory of Brahma after long years of exchange with Abraham Musa. In his 1827 letter to Abraham Musa, he admitted that grammar, grammar in the Chinese language plays an implicit role. He quote, the sense of context plays a supporting role to grammar. This is the particularity of the Chinese language. I quote, in the Chinese language, the sense of context is the base of intelligence and grammatical construction should always be deduced from the context. The method used in classical languages to proceed by the search for the words in the dictionary before undertaking grammatical work and examination of construction is never applicable to the Chinese language. One should always begin by the meaning of the words. By once, but once this meaning is well established, Chinese sentences are no more subjected to amphibology. End of quote. Humboldt also admitted that works in Chinese language are exceptionally stylistic. This should be attributed to the non-formal way of language use in Chinese. I quote again, the very remarkable style in Chinese works comes from the immediate context of the ideas of the entirely new relation which is born between the idea and the expression by almost the entire absence of grammatical signs and the arch of arrangement of words facilitated by Chinese physiology in such a way to highlight the very construction of reciprocal relations of ideas." End of quote, on my own translation too. To Humboldt, there is no doubt that the sense of construction of Chinese phraseology, which is free from any necessary connection to the spoken language, always allows a greater freedom and more pure expression of thoughts. Without fixed grammatical forms, the Chinese language gains by, quote, is more simple, bold, and concise way of presentation of ideas, end of quote. The effect produced by the structural characteristics of Chinese, Chinese linguistic space does not fall only on the ideas thus formed, but also on the mind. I quote again uh, from Nunbo. By imposing a meditative work on the mind much greater than all other languages would demand, by isolating on the relations of the ideas, by cutting it almost entirely off, from any mechanical support by basing the construction almost exclusively on the sequence of ideas arranged according to their determinative quality, the Chinese language awakens and maintains in the mind the activity which brings itself toward the isolated thought and draws it away from all that would change it and beautify the expressions." End of quote. Also my translation. Humboldt added, added that this advantage is not limited to the handling of philosophical ideas but also to narratives and description. I quote, by giving forces, by giving force to the expression of sentiment. That is the reason why Chinese literature is so rich since the pre qin era, that means two centuries before Christ, because the linguistic space of its language provides this possibility. Now, Hombok recognized that though the Chinese language does not have formal grammatical perfection of the classical languages, it can express fine ideas as exact as the latter. So Chinese is another language of perfection, which is entirely different from the Indo-European languages. The linguistic space of the Chinese language enables a different way of connection of ideas, and thus a different mode of operation of thought, but as efficient and exact as classical languages. This is, a humble, this is Humboldt's conclusion after sincere scientific debate with the French sinologist Albert de Musa. This exchange with Albert de Musa on the particularity of the Chinese language has played a rather important role in the evolution of Humboldt's conception of comparative linguistics. It also drew his attention to the problem of incomprehensibility or misunderstanding across different linguistic borders. Incomprehensibility or misunderstanding is not an accident in intercultural understanding, it's rather a common character. The role of intercultural understanding is precisely to overcome incomprehensibility or misunderstanding. Thus, there is further work to follow. Hermeneutics of texts of other cultures, 
But hermeneutics cannot be limited to ideas, but should also be extended to symbols, signs, and images of cultural alterity. Section four, the question of picture of space, but I, I will treat this very, very uh, limitedly. Uh, pictorial space in Chinese calligraphy, but in embedded in Chinese writing is not merely a linguistic space. It comprises a pictorial space. Chinese calligraphy is an art in itself. As an example, Xuan Zhang's Chinese version of the Ha Sutra, Xinjing, has always been motive of works of great Chinese calligraphers. Now, this is by one of the famous um, um, calligrapher, Ou Yang Xuan, is uh, from the sixth century, at the same uh, the same century of uh, of uh, uh, Chen Zhang's Chinese translation of the Ha Sutra. Just the complete the complete uh, Ha Sutra is there in just two hundred sixty verses. But the, the uh, this style of calligraphy is one of the models inherited to now today. Mm -hmm. Now this is by another as later is um the uh Yuan, that means the 13th century, Zhong Mangbu. The style is a, di a bit different. And then to the Qing dynasty, the emperor Qian Long, he too he is a practitioner of calligraphy, and then he amused by showing his you know culture now. With Xinjiang, uh, with uh, uh, the Ha Sutra as the, the context of his of showing his calligraphy. But the exploration of pictorial space is not the privilege of what Hong Book call community of perfect language. People with no writing can also have an extraordinary sense of pictorial space. This can be shown by the facial paintings of the Kaduveo people. In the, this is there, one of the Amazonian Indians deported in his topic by Levi Strauss in 1950, published in 1955. This is the first, the cover of the first edition of, of, of um, Levi Strauss' his topic, the French edition. That's precisely the cover is illustrated by the facial paintings of the Caduveo people. A child, a young child, a woman, a young lady. People used to call this kind of facial painting primitive art. But is this kind of primitive art primitive? This is not figurative painting. It is not constructed by color paints, but by mere lines, signs, or symbols on the human body. It requires exceptional technique. This kind of art is the catalyzer of cubism, abstract art, and surrealist art of the 20th century Europe. Thus, primitive art is not the synonym of inferiority of technique and imagination. There is the coincidence of the artists and the appreciators of art. Primitive art is not an art of community. It is everything other than primitive. Section five, how to construct cultural universals of differential cultural spaces? As pointed above, misunderstanding is a common character in intercultural understanding. To overcome misunderstanding of cultural otherness, we must accept intercultural differences, but we must also recognize that there exist universals across cultures. Following Meryl Ponty, we think that cultural universals exist of lateral universals, universal la terra. Understood in the language of Kant, lateral universal is not obtained by determining judgment, which is assigned an a priori status from the outset and excludes all particulars from the empirical realm, which are not conformed to the a priori requirement. It is judged, it, this kind of judgment uh, you, um, is of the top down way. This is, this is um, um, determining judgment. Rather, lateral judgment is obtained by reflecting judgment from the reflection out of commonality of particulars in the empirical realm. 
judgment from the bottom of way. Where does literal universal comes from? From intercultural understanding. All living cultures will exit from themselves and move toward cultural otherness away from themselves. But this kind of transmission is often not merely a one-way traffic. There is always coming, coming and going between cultures. Often a third culture can serve as a bridge between cultural transmission among different cultures. The transmission of Buddhism from the Indian subcontinent to East Asia via China is an imminent example. So my conclusion, intercultural understanding in philosophy has a further work. Development of intercultural hermeneutics to overcome incompatibility or misunderstanding of ideas through uh, thoughts across cultures. Thank you.